Chapter Three of the Hoosier Schoolmaster by Edward Eggleston. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bridget Gage. Chapter Three: Mirandy, Hank, and Shocky. Mirandy had nothing but contempt for the new master until he developed the bulldog in his character. Mirandy fell in love with the bulldog. It was at the close of that very second day on which Ralph had achieved his first victory over the school, and in which Mirandy had been seized with her desperate passion for him, that she told him about it. Not in words. We do not allow that in the most civilized countries, and still less would it be tolerated in Hoople County. But Mirandy told the master the fact that she was in love with him, though no word passed her lips. She walked by him from school. She cast at him what are commonly called sheep's eyes. Ralph thought them more like calf's eyes. She changed the whole tone of her voice. She whined ordinarily. Now she whimpered. And so by ogling him, by blushing at him, by tittering at him, by giggling at him, by snickering at him, by simpering at him, by making herself tenfold more a fool even than nature had made her, she managed to convey to the dismayed soul of the young teacher the frightful intelligence that he was loved by the richest, the ugliest, the silliest, the coarsest, and the most entirely contemptible girl in the Flat Creek district. Ralph sat by the fire the next morning trying to read a few minutes before school time, while the boys were doing the chores and the bound girl was milking the cows, with no one in the room but the old woman. She was generally as silent as Bud, but now she seemed for some unaccountable reason disposed to talk. She had sat down on the broad hearth to have her usual morning smoke, the poplar table, adorned by no cloth, stood in the middle of the floor. The unwashed blue teacups sat in the unwashed blue saucers. The unwashed blue plates kept company with the begrimed blue pitcher. The dirty skillets by the fire were kept in countenance by the dirtier pots. And the ashes were drifted and strewn over the hearthstones in a most picturesque way. "'You see,' said the old woman, knocking the residuum from her cob-pipe, and chafing some dry leaf between her withered hands, preparatory to filling it again. "'You see, Mr. Hartsook, my ole man's pretty well along in the world. He's got a right smart lot of this world's plunder, one way and another.' And while she stuffed the tobacco into her pipe, Ralph wondered why she should mention it to him. "'You see, we moved in here nigh upon twenty-five years ago.' "'Twas when my Jack, him as died afore Bud was born, was a baby. "'But'll be twenty-one the fifth of next June.' "'Here Mrs. Means stopped to rake a live coal out of the fire with her skinny finger, "'and then to carry it in her skinny palm to the bowl, or to the hole, of her cob-pipe. "'When she got the smoke a-going, she proceeded. "'You see, this year bottom land was all Congress land, in them there days, "'and it sold for a dollar and a quarter.' And I says to my old man, Jack, says I, Jack, do you get a plenty while you're a gittin? Get a plenty while you're a gittin, says I, for it won't never be no cheaper in tis now. And it hain't been, I knowed twouldn't. And Mrs. Means took the pipe from her mouth to indulge in a good chuckle at the thought of her financial shrewdness. Get a plenty while you're a gittin, says I. I could see, you know, that they was a powerful sight of money in Congress land. That's what made me say, Get a plenty while you're a gittin. And Jack, he's worth lots and gobs of money, all made out of Congress land. Jack didn't get rich by hard work. Bless you, no, not him. That ain't his way. Hard work, aunt, you know. Twas that air six hundred dollars he got along of me, all salted down into Flat Crick Bottoms at a dollar and a quarter a acre. And twas my sayin, get a plenty while you're a gittin, as done it. And here the old ogre laughed, or grinned horribly, at Rolf, showing her few straggling, discolored teeth. Then she got up and knocked the ashes out of her pipe, and laid the pipe away and walked round in front of Rolf. After adjusting the chunks so that the fire would burn, she turned her yellow face toward Rolf, and scanning him closely came out with the climax of her speech and the remark, "'You see as how, Mr. Hartsook, the man what gets my mirandy will do well.' Flat Crick lands, worth nigh upon a hundred a acre. This gentle hint came near knocking Ralph down. Had Flat Creek land been worth a hundred times a hundred dollars an acre, and had he owned five hundred times means five hundred acres, he would have given it all just at that moment to have annihilated the whole tribe of meanses. Except Bud. Bud was a giant, but a good-natured one. 
he thought he would accept Bud from the general destruction. As for the rest, he mentally pictured to himself the pleasure of attending their funerals. There was one thought, however, between him and despair. He felt confident that the cordiality, the intensity, and the persistency of his dislike of cis means were such that he should never inherit a foot of the Flat Creek bottoms. But what about Bud? What if he joined the conspiracy to marry him to this weak-eyed, weak-headed wood-nymph, or backwoods-nymph? If Ralph felt it a misfortune to be loved by Mirandy Means, he found himself almost equally unfortunate in having incurred the hatred of the meanest boy in school. Hank, Banta, low-browed, smirky, and crafty, was the first sufferer by Ralph's determination to use corporal punishment, and so— Henry Banta, who was a compound of deceit and resentment, never lost an opportunity to annoy the young schoolmaster, who was obliged to live perpetually on his guard against his tricks. One morning, as Ralph walked toward the schoolhouse, he met little Shockey. What the boy's first name or last name was, the teacher did not know. He had given his name as Shockey, and all the teacher knew was that he was commonly called Shockey, that he was an orphan, that he lived with a family named Pearson over in Rocky Hollow, and that he was the most faithful and affectionate child in the school. On this morning that I speak of, Ralph had walked toward the school eagerly to avoid the company of Mirandy. But not caring to sustain his dignity longer than was necessary, he loitered along the road, admiring the trunks of the maples, and picking up a beech nut now and then. Just as he was about to go on toward the school, he caught sight of little Shockey running swiftly toward him, but looking from side to side, as if afraid of being seen. "'Well, Shockey, what is it?' And Ralph put his hand kindly on the great bushy head of white hair from which came Shockey's nickname. Shockey had to pant a minute. "'Why, Mr. Hartsook,' he gasped, scratching his head, "'they's a pond down under the schoolhouse.' And here Shockey's breath gave out entirely for a minute. "'Yes, Shockey, I know that. What about it? The trustees haven't come to fill it up, have they?' "'Oh, no, sir, but Hank Banta, you know,' and Shockey took another breathing spell, standing as close to Ralph as he could, for poor Shockey got all his sunshine from the master's presence. "'Has Henry fallen in and got a ducking, Shockey?' "'Oh, no, sir, he wants to get you in, you see.' "'Well, I won't go in, though, Shockey.' "'But you see, he's been and gone and pulled back the board that you have to step on to get ahind your desk.' He's been and gone and pulled back the board so as you can't help a tippin' it up and sousin' right in if you step there. And so you came to tell me. There was a huskiness in Ralph's voice. He had then one friend in Flat Creek District, poor little Shockey. He put his arm around Shockey just a moment, and then told him to hasten across to the other road so as to come back to the schoolhouse in a direction at right angles to the master's approach. But the caution was not needed. Shockey had taken care to leave in that way, and was altogether too cunning to be seen coming down the road with Mr. Hartsook. But after he got over the fence to go through the sugar camp, or sugar orchard, as they say at the east, he stopped and turned back once or twice, just to catch one more smile from Rolf. And then he hied away through the tall trees, a very happy boy, kicking and ploughing the brown leaves before him in his perfect delight, saying over and over again, "'How he looked at me!' how he did look. And when Ralph came up to the schoolhouse door, there was Shockey sauntering along from the other direction, throwing bits of limestone at fence rails, and smiling still clear down to his shoes at the thought of the master's kind words. "'What a queer boy Shockey is,' remarked Betsy Short, with a giggle. "'He just likes to wander round alone. I see him a-comin' out of the sugar camp just now. He's been in there half an hour.' and Betsy giggled again, for Betsy Short could giggle on slighter provocation than any other girl on Flat Creek. When Ralph Hartsook, with the quiet, dogged tread that he was cultivating, walked into the schoolroom, he took great care not to seem to see the trap set for him, but he carelessly stepped over the board that had been so nicely adjusted. The boys who were Hank's confidants in the plot were very busy over their slates, and took pains not to show their disappointment. The morning session wore on without incident. Ralph several times caught two people looking at him. One was Mirandy. Her weak and watery eyes stole loving glances over the top of her spelling book, which she would not study. Her looks made Ralph's spirits sink to forty below zero, and congeal. 
but on one of the backless little benches that sat in the middle of the schoolroom was little Shocky, who also cast many love glances at the young master, glances as grateful to his heart as Mirandy's ogling, he was tempted to call it ogring, was hateful. "'Look at Shocky,' giggled Betsy Short behind her slate. "'He looks as if he was a-goin' to eat the master up, body and soul.' And so the forenoon wore on as usual, and those who laid the trap had forgotten it themselves. The morning session was drawing to a close. The fire in the great old fireplace had burnt low. The flames, which seemed to Shocky to be angels, had disappeared, and now the bright coals, which had played the part of men and women and houses in Shocky's fancy, had taken on a white and downy covering of ashes, and the great half-burnt backlog lay there smoldering like a giant asleep in a snowdrift. Shocky longed to wake him up. As for Henry Banta, he was too much bothered to get the answer to a sum he was doing, to remember anything about his trap. In fact, he had quite forgotten that half an hour ago, in the all-absorbing employment of drawing ugly pictures on his slate, and coaxing Betsy Short to giggle by showing them slyly across the room. Once or twice Ralph had been attracted to Betsy's extraordinary fits of giggling, and had come so near to catching Hank that the boy thought it best not to run any further risk of the beach switches, four or five feet long, laid up behind the master inside of the school as a prophylactic. Hence his application just now to his sum in long division, and hence his puzzled look, for, idler that he was, his sums did not solve themselves easily. As usual in such cases, he came up in front of the master's desk to have the difficulty explained. He had to wait a minute until Ralph got through with showing Betsy Short, who had been seized with a studying fit, and who could hardly give any attention to the teacher's explanations. She did want to giggle so much. Not at anything in particular, but just at things in general. While Ralph was doing Betsy's sum for her, he was solving a much more difficult question. A plan had flashed upon him but the punishment seemed a severe one. He gave it up once or twice, but he remembered how turbulent the Flat Creek elements were, and had he not inly resolved to be as unrelenting as a bulldog? He fortified himself by recalling again the oft-remembered remark of Bud, "'If Bull wants to take a holt, heaven and earth can't make him let go.' And so he resolved to give Hank and the whole school one good lesson." "'Just step round behind me, Henry, and you can see how I do this,' said Ralph. Hank was entirely off his guard, and with his eyes fixed upon the slate on the teacher's desk, he sidled round upon the broad, loose board misplaced by his own hand, and in an instant the other end of the board rose up in the middle of the schoolroom, almost striking Shocky in the face, while Henry Banta went down into the ice-cold water beneath the schoolhouse. "'Why, Henry!' cried Ralph, jumping to his feet with well-feigned surprise. How did this happen? And he helped the dripping fellow out, and seated him by the fire. Betsy Short giggled. Shocky was so tickled that he could hardly keep his seat. The boys who were in the plot looked very serious indeed. Ralph made some remarks by way of improving the occasion. He spoke strongly of the utter meanness of the one who could play so heartless a trick on a schoolmate. He said that it was as much thieving to get your fun at the expense of another as to seal his money. And while he talked, all eyes were turned on Hank. All except the eyes of Mirandy Means. They looked simperingly at Ralph. All the rest looked at Hank. The fire had made his face very red. Shocky noticed that. Betsy Short noticed it and giggled. The master wound up with an appropriate quotation from Scripture. He said that the person who displaced that board had better not be encouraged by the success, and he said success with a curious emphasis, of the present experiment to attempt another trick of the kind. For it was set down in the Bible that if a man dug a pit for the feet of another, he would be very likely to fall in it himself. Which made all the pupils look solemn, except Betsy Short, who giggled. And Shocky wanted to. And Mirandy cast an expiring look at Ralph. And if the teacher was not lovesick, he certainly was sick of Mirandy's love. When school was let out, Ralph gave Hank every caution that he could about taking cold, and even lent him his overcoat, very much against Hank's will, for Hank had obstinately refused to go home before the school was dismissed. Then the master walked out in a quiet and subdued way to spend the noon recess in the woods, while Shocky watched his retreating footsteps with loving admiration. 
and the pupils not in the secret canvassed the question of who moved the board. Bill Means said he'd bet Hank did it, which set Betsy short off in an uncontrollable giggle, and Shocky listened innocently. But that night Bud said slyly, "'Thunder and lightning! What a manager you air, Mr. Hartsook!' To which Ralph returned no reply except a friendly smile. Muscle paid tribute to brains that time. But Ralph had no time for exultation, for just here came the spelling school. End of chapter 3